Okay, so uh, let me then. Uh, right, yesterday at the uh, class uh, lecture, we had a discussion on the physical aspects of the We also did a little hands on to give you a glimpse of how, uh, if you go beyond this little image, see how things change, how basically you see an example of my degree connection, we saw how peer instability develops. In, in most of the astrological systems, this is the case. Usually, MST kind of gives you an overall picture, but you need to include more and more physics, non ideal MST physics, which gives you much better insight into certain problems. And certain problems require that. So, to date, uh, that idea would be that in this uh, lecture, in the next 40 minutes or so, give you a glimpse of how it is done computationally. Pluto. And when you add non-ideal terms, how do you basically add these non-ideal terms? To so I will give you just a glimpse of it. So if you look into code, you'll get much better idea and so on. And I will show you some examples of how uh, significant difference non-ideal physics can make uh, in a very, very simple problem also. Okay. So just a brief uh, uh, review of yesterday, I and mean, we had this discussion about a basic model, which is a standard hydro model, which kind of gives you an overall physical overview of a system, but may or may not be useful to explain all the intricacies of astrophysical systems. You, of course, see thermodynamics. We all know that uh, thermodynamics is important. We studied about radiative transfer yesterday. Zanusha gave a talk today. We discussed about Another radiative process, which is much more simpler. And we'll see how significant that difference the radiative process makes in, in simulations. Then, of course, magnetic fields. We talked a lot about magnetic fields, ideal MHD, and uh, associated instabilities. And, of course, uh, we saw something was dissipation effect. So, magnetic energy getting dissipated in the magnetic dimension event. So, I'll talk about magnetic resistivity again and how it is incorporated in the code. So you saw how it is done. You use the rest, the rest eta not c to kaha jump. Where where this coming from? So of course, relativity that is not what uh, that's right. So uh, when you talk about non-ideal terms or non-ideal or principal physics beyond the standard ideal MHD, then uh, you see you have uh, if you look at the standard equations of uh, conservation equations, you essentially have a del by del t of some quantity q plus divergence of the flux equal to zero. That is usually the standard uh, form of conservative equations. That's something I think the Martin and Kathik have been to in their earlier classes. Then you want to add more physics. Now, you can, the way to do this is they will always be added as a source, an additional term to this framework of conservative equation. Now, these sources, when you add based on the physics, may or may not be conservative. In a sense, like when you add a source term to a conservative equation, of course, you are adding more things to it. Right? For example, if you are adding a mass conservation equation, you add a additional mass. On the right hand side, and if you're adding mass to the system, mass is not conserved. Because you're adding mass to the system. Okay, so that is essentially called a source term, it is not conserved. But in certain cases, the source terms that you add or the additional physics terms that you add can be made conservative. In that sense, even with the addition of that physics, the whole system remains conserved. Okay, so we will look into these kind of uh, problems and optically. So I have chosen two examples. One is magnetic activity, which is like conservative that kind of thing. Of course, magnetic energy gets dissipated, that's fine. But it is it can be written in a conservative manner. So essentially, it can be translated into the form of L by density of some quantity plus divergence of a flux. And then I have chosen an example of optically thin radiation cool. And this is the case when there's loss. So it's basically like a loss term. So essentially, you will lose energy. So this is not conservative, but this is conservative. So I've chosen two examples in which you have a conservative form and a non -term. And how it is basically implemented in the code is what we will really see. And what are the implications of this? And of course, apart from that, there are different search terms which are basically present. For example, gravity. 
which can be written both in a vector form. This is essentially not conservative, but if you write it in a potential form, if you forward it can be in a potential form, you can uh, the force will be grand form, you can basically put it inside the divergence. That's so why it becomes conservative. Okay. So gravity is there, that's a body force in, in Pluto. Then you have other effects like antipolar diffusion and Hall effect. So that also are there. There are additional effects uh, in your MST problem. So they are also sometimes very important. For example, antipolar diffusion is a crucial role when you are talking about collapse of molecular clouds. But there you will have uh, quasi-neutral plasma molecules or neutrals, which will actually slip away from the magnetic field. So that is essentially what antipolar diffusion does. Then you have a very important aspect of this thermal conduction and viscosity. Now, all thermal conduction, viscosity, and magnetic gasivities are essentially almost similar way of handling in, in the question. I'm going to show one only. Physics is, of course, different. Magnetic gasivity is a different physics. Thermal conduction has a different physics, and viscosity is different. For example, viscosity is very important when you want to do accretion um, in, 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 uh, in, and so on. Okay. And then, of course, you have uh, offset of working rotating frame. Sometimes it's very useful. For example, if you are doing something, let's say, um, uh, in a rotating earth or a rotating sun frame, you can always go in the frame of the, the rotating frame and do your work. And you know that physics tells that if you are in the rotating inertial frame, you will have axial returns in your force. Centrifuge, uh, centri uh, uh, the IR of the force is centrifugal force and so on will come here. All these forces will come. So that is also accounted for it. And of course, you can have more equation of state, different equation of states. Okay. So these are all additional ways, uh, these are different ways in which Proto handles additional physics from the standard ideal MHD ideal hydrodynamics, which you have been learning about this. Okay. So how we will add some of this physics? <laughs> overall fabric, overall design. Sure, on the way that this all remains the same or similar. But when you add these source terms, some modification has to be done in the real solar system equations. So I'm going to basically give you an idea on how it is done. Right. So just to give you uh, a review, so this is basically the way you write the standard conservative MST equations. So essentially you write. So this is for example the mass conservation of del by del of rho plus divergence of rho p. That's the mass flux, and this is the quantity which represents the mass. Then you have the momentum flux, and then you essentially have the momentum. Uh, uh, this is the momentum flux, and this is essentially the momentum rho p. Then you have the energy flux and the energy. So, yeah. This is the induction equation, and of course. The function gave a nice uh, overview of how to ensure average of the zero. So this is kind of inherent. So this is not a solved, but these equations are solved, and you kind of uh, have an idea of how these equations are written. So now, for example, if I add any source term on the right hand side, okay, if I add any source term in the right hand side, and if I get converted into a divergence form. And so let us say I add a, a right a some term on the right hand side in the induction equation. I convert it into a divergence form. Then I can bring this term inside this divergence. Then everything remains the same. I just have to modify the flux. And all the processes, what you have learned, then from the induction spill out, and you use your revamp problem, everything remains the same. So when a source term is added such that it can be added inside the conservative bracket, the uh, uh, um, the, the non-linear physics of the non-ideal physics is conservative in nature. And that's what magnetic resistivity is. But if you look at uh, a term which is in which this is really not less, and you cannot write it in a divergence form, then there will be a non-zero source term. So it will be lost. Okay. So that is the that is the basic idea behind this. So if I want to now make it slightly more complex, slightly more um, steady for you. And again, basically write the equations in a slightly more different manner. So now this is what uh, the numerical people, uh, numeric, when you want to do solve the problem, write the very general form, conservative equation. So del by del T of this quantity U, this is the quantity which you want to conserve, uh, is the average of flux 
or that which is which can be a function of this quantity q. For example, if you look at this, u in this case is rho and the flux is rho v. So essentially it's a function of uh, this. So these are all called uh conservative parameters. You want more conservative states. And if you are essentially mm -hmm. fluxes. Okay, so these are essentially the uh, conservative parameters. So that's what we do. That's what we do. In not huge functions, you only have to do it. You you give you don't give real gain. You never get wrong. So these are called primitive variables. But essentially, all in the world, you are not primitive variables. You give the initial condition primitive variables, you will never get wrong. So these are called primitive variables. But essentially, all in the world, you are not primitive variables. You give the initial condition primitive variables, you will never get wrong. So these are called primitive variables. But essentially, all in the world, you are not primitive variables. So you give input as primitive. So conservative method convert that way. It has all the magic that we know. So the next conservative, third conservative step is primitive. Okay. Then this is essentially the flux in uh, basically in ideal imaging. So this is kind of very easy. This is the same thing I have written down in uh, in a matrix. And these are essentially all the source terms. So some of the source terms. For example, you can see the viscosities are in the brown. So essentially, all terms related to the viscosity are mentioned in brown. Now you can clearly see that, of course, in R in specific in the viscous terms, uh, uh, you can see that I have written in terms of divergence term. So I can always plug it in over here, and everything remains the same. Okay, so that means it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of conservative. Similarly, for the resistivity. J cross P, which is a divergence term on it, basically can go in. Here you will see it's a cross term, but essentially you can write it in a divergence term as well. So that we will see how it is to be done. Because it is del cross E or J, but J is also del cross B. So you can write everything into a divergence term. So you can basically remove all that. Okay. So this is the whole, uh, I mean, you have the, for example, this is the trouble conduction flux. This is also diameter which can go inside the energy. So there are certain things which are conservative, certain things which are non-conservative. So we will look into these. Right. So let us focus on resistivity uh, to begin with. Uh, so the idea behind resistivity is that you have an induction equation, which is del B by del T is minus grad uh, cos of E in the electric field. And usually the way we write the electric field is just this. In an ideal MHD equation, is equal to minus u cross b. That's it. That's your ideal. So that is essentially because of the motion of the conduction. So essentially, an electric field. And it moves the electrons. When the moves in magnetic field, it generates electric field. It is essentially the uh, the reason why you have this. Okay. But when you talk about additional physics or physics which are non ideal. Then you should also allow for these electrons to slip through this, and therefore there will be a resistance towards motion, and that is essentially the resistivity, and that happens because of collision. Okay, so if there is, let's say, massive nuclear blast, you can have electrons colliding with, let's say, ions or neutrons. Because of this collision or coulombic collisions, you kind of lose your solid spots. Okay, so you have this term here, which is kind of like a of representing that microphysical processes, basically conditional processes. Now, if you recollect in the dramatic recollection picture, there was a very small region for the recollection or the collisions happens. That's where your resistivity also became important. Okay, so that this is essentially the resistivity. So this is like I will added this term here. Now, if you do, I, I mean, it's always like this. But in ideal energy, you say that oh. Uh, my uh, yeah, resistivity is kind of uh, very, very small, or conductance is very, very high, essentially. So you kind of neglect this. But in, in cases when you cannot neglect, you basically have this term. So this is kind of the uh, second. There's an addition term here, which is usually added, and it's basically called on by any J cross P. So this is the Hall term. So this is the Hall term, and you have this one by any kind of. Uh, uh, denominator. So then there is a gradient of electron pressure. Now, how do I write this equation? It's very simple. If you know MHD in general is a single fluid emission. 
सो एवरीथिंग इज वन फ्लूड फॉर इट नो इलेक्ट्रॉन दर इज नो प्रोटॉन्स सब कुछ एक ही फ्लूड है यू राइट सेपरेट इक्वेशन फॉर द इलेक्ट्रॉन्स एंड द प्रोटॉन्स and then you do all the uh, manipulation you will essentially end up having this expression and the eta would be of this form when eta will be uh, proportional to the positional frequency the mass of the electron uh, and then e square so this is essentially the eta form if you write in that and this expression of the electric field is essentially called a generalized ohm's law okay It's a generalized Ohm's law. You have a term corresponding to magnetic resistivity. You have a term corresponding to Wall effect. You have a term corresponding to gradient of electron pressure, which happens at very small scales, like electron size scales. So, if you are solving a problem at plasma scales, which we will see in the next class, the Zipkin class, then all these things becomes important. But the question then is that can we solve such kind of problems uh, uh, on a larger scale? So that is an issue. Because essentially this is all approximation. We don't know these microphysical terms here, so it's all approximation. Yes. So, what is the physical difference between the resistive term and the electron pressure? Oh, electron pressure basically is okay. So electron pressure happens because of the collision between electrons. So essentially, it's like collisions. This is there. There's a gradient of uh, uh, electron pressure. Essentially, uh, electrons exert pressure on themselves because they now are kind of acting like uh, particles in some sense, like just like kinetic particles. When you have very very high uh, density of electrons, uh, or when you are basically in the scales of gyro radius of the electrons, your electrons can be basically just like kinetic particles, and they will exert pressure just like kinetic particle does by putting a force on the wall. So this is a very very small scale. This is only important at electron gyro scales. So this is very, very, very uh, kind of uh, that part, and this is basically because of the effects of the other charge. Like J cross B is basically because of the currents that go. So they, it depends on the drift velocities between the two charges. So that is that is how it is. All these are physics which are microphysical of physical origin. So you kind of approximate them, and the approximation is hidden inside this eta one by n a and so on and so forth. So we use this to solve the common static and dimensional systems. So like the eta, which is there, is it the same as other that we have? Yes, yes. So one by eta is the sigma. One by this. So now, uh, how do we get it into all of these equations in the book? So what goes under the hood? It's basically first the task is to ensure that it will be easy. So we had a, a discussion on that those aspects. Now there are dissipative terms. So these are kind of thermal conduction, magnetic resistivity, and viscosity. And as we saw, it is written down in terms of our version of some. So it can be basically just added into the flux. And you would see that you can write it in terms of dimensions, but these are essentially parabolic terms. Why they are parabolic terms? Because Yesterday, in the case of resistivity, we had a theta del square beta. So it's kind of a diffusion term. Okay. So if you just neglect this part, let's say, you just look at this equation. What is this equation? It's a diffusion kind of equation, like a heat equation. So basically, just like heating the rod, it, the heat diffuses. So diffusion rod. Diffusion is more hyperbolic. Hyperbolic problems that you have been dealing with with waves and so on. That is different than diffusion. Diffusion problems are essentially called as parabolic. So essentially, they are called parabolic. So essentially, different way of solving uh, these things. Okay, so they are essentially called the parabolic terms, or the parabolic terms that comes up from the thermal conduction, magnetic resistivity, and especially physical process that pure diffusion. In this case, the magnetic field is diffusing. Uh, so uh, I mean, yeah, which is handled by the resistivity. Okay. Now there is a fundamental problem here. Okay. So 
you will see in the next slide, there's a fundamental problem here. The problem is as follows. Now, if you look at this equation over here, n given n k is equal to, let's say, for the middle part, is the dense per k. Now, what is the time scale? Can you tell me, what will be the time scale associated with this? That's a diffusion time scale. What will be a time scale? Can anyone tell me? What will be the time scale associated with this? From the equation you can tell. Dimensional match on a chair. What? So what is the dimension of the time? The right hand side x square by theta. And plan square by x square. So x square by theta. Theta by x square. Theta by theta. X square is x square. I. So L square by eta, right? That's your time scale. That's your diffusion time scale. Now, the thing is that this will be basically what will be the time scale here? Two by L. Some, some flow velocity divided by, uh, 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 so it's L by U basically. So now the point here is that if I want to solve this uh, future, uh, as you will see, uh, okay. The, the idea is if you're going to solve the diffusion problem explicitly, okay, just want to just write it down explicitly and solve this diffusion problem. Then my resolution is delta x. Then I have to ensure that my time scale goes as delta x square by eta. So smaller the delta x. Smaller will be the time scale. Okay. See, there's a so basically the solution goes with a different time scale. The direction goes with a different time scale. There are two different time scales in your problem now. One is going with delta L x square by eta, another one is going just with L delta x by u. Okay. So now if I want to capture the physics of this, I have to ensure that my simulation goes with this time, not with this time. You understand this? This is very crucial. You, your simulation should basically go with this term, not with this term. Okay. So now the problem is that if I want to solve a very big problem with very high resolution, I have to go to very small time step to capture this. That's why your explicit time. That's why you are doing this. I'm not causing this because explicit. Which force layer delta L and assumes that it goes in delta L and choose explicit. You will be you will be trouble because the time step will go very small because it has to capture this. Okay, so there's a way to come out of this. Okay, so there are techniques and numerical methods to come out of this, and they are essentially uh, the explicit, uh, they are essentially super time stepping, and so on. Um, and we will we'll talk about this a little bit um, in in the coming time. So we I'll I'll have a discussion about what are these Runge Kutta and so on. So the idea is that if you want to capture the physics, you have to capture that time scale. <clears throat> and if you cap if you basically just not capture the time scale, you're gone. Yes. Uh, how does uh, the CFL time step point? So, so CFL is a okay. So in, uh, in uh, uh, so there are two CFLs. One is CFL hyperbolic, one is CFL parabolic. So uh, uh, in this case, the CFL condition is done as usual as not. In this thing also, you will have a parabolic time, uh, parabolic CF. Okay. So that is, we will also have a look at that. But uh, uh, in general, you can actually use the same CFL condition, same CFL, but uh, you should ensure that this is going to delta L square, not a delta L. So in a CFL condition, there is half delta X by delta T to offer delta X square L. And to take an eta biaga and if you have eta comes in there, okay. So if I put a larger eta or a smaller eta, the time step is even larger, larger eta, smaller time step is small. So you have to be careful about that aspect. So that's the idea. And so there were there are certain techniques which are developed. So you can also show this implicitly. So there are techniques that are implicit and explicit. The, the, uh, the solution of the Next time only depends on the previous time. And implicit is like you can also have to um, other time patterns. In that case, you don't have to worry about this. But implicit problems are 
they are complicated to parallelize. So we use something called as uh, some techniques, uh, which are Nongekut uh, and and sometimes different techniques to actually ensure that we can parallelize the system well and also do it faster, as you would have seen. Apart from these parabolic terms, there are also source terms that I was talking about. These are called explicit source terms. So essentially, in this case, you may not observe the total energy or total momentum or whatever. And adding them basically uh, can give rise to some source terms. So we will have to see how we can do this. Okay. So now the point here is that uh, if I, if you basically have these two operators, I mean you can think of it in this case that you have an operator of one. An action operator which goes with this time, and you have an operator two which is the current record which goes with this time. Okay, so if I have these two operators are uh, working on this thing, so for example, if I go back here, so you can think of, for example, in this energy equation, you can think of uh, a term without this that's an ideal case, and with this, only with this that's a resistive case. So you have two operators. So how do I basically club these two operators? Solve it. Because I have to obtain with time. So how do I club these operators and solve it? And the idea behind this comes uh, what is known as prime operator split. This is second order accurate in time, and this is what Pluto is. So I'll explain to you what it is very simply. So if I have an equation L Q by L T, which is basically equal to some operator Q plus some operator uh, uh, um, so this is essentially you can think of this as divergence of s of u and this one is basically divergence of this parabolic okay so then how do i basically club this the idea is very neat uh it works is that you start with some qn when you any cell state that's it and then you just update this part of the equation but for time delta t by 2. Then you get q star. Right? Then what you do is you update q star with this only. So del q star by delta t is equal to O2 q star. And you and you solve this for time delta t to get q prime. Okay. And then you update q prime with just O1 or the operator 1. For time delta t will go, and you get q n plus one. So that's how you do the trick. And then you get times two. You do exactly the same thing, but the operators are small. So first you then operate the two, then o one and o. So it's like this: o one, o two, o one, o two, o one, o. So like that only. If you do this, then you get uh, second order accuracy. Yeah, if you so that is what Luca does. One will always be later on, into like time states. One will be when in the high school, book, yes, that's true. No, so when you come to so O2 will be delta divided, yes. So, but the difference between the two time scales goes quadratic with uh, uh with length scales, so. Uh, at large enough length scales, the difference between the time scales would be such that no, no. So, so basically, this is basically a dimension task. So, so okay. Pluto basically defines uh, the minimum of all the time scales that are tiny systems. It has a global minimum. So if you have 10 time steps in your systems, let's say you have 10 orbitals, of the minimum regard, then that is your delta. So you have to work on the lowest time scale. That's Pluto's uh, structure. So it's a little global dancer. So for example, if I do explicit yeah. uh, in this case, then the time step will be delta square by eta. Fixed. Yeah. So you cannot change that. Because that will always go to the smallest time step. And take that as the time step and task. So that will be the delta. Then the admission takes will be taken care of this. This goes in the same time step. So, okay. So that's how uh, strong operator split works. It's a very cute uh, kind of algorithm, and one can prove this to be second order in time. <laughs> if you if you work on this, right? So now um, 
Let us look at uh, resistivity in slightly more details. Uh, so if you look at the flux u, f of u, remember del q by del t is plus divergence of f of u equal to zero. Was our case because essentially this flux can be written in terms of uh, divergence. Now you can write it down. So these are the two things. So the resistivity comes only in the induction equation and in the energy equation because essentially heat will be generated only heating. So you have flux can be written in two parts, just like what we have in two operators, so one in the and the hyperbolic. Okay. So the flux can be written in two parts. You, if I put parabolic equal to zero, you know how to solve this. Easy. You've been doing this. You, have, you know all of this. But now I've added a parabolic operator. So now. We should know how how I should do the solution in the parameter. And uh, when you want to combine this, you would basically use the operator. Okay, so that is how Pluto works. Now to get the solution of the parameter for it. So remember, this is so think of this as operator one and this as operator two. So remember, in this plot, you have an O2 for delta P. So how do you do from there? Idea is that this is the O2 only. You remember, you know this. This is del P by del T. It's average of E rest. So this is only O2. So this is only the parabolic flux. Only the heat. This here. That you can basically write it down in a in a divergence form. You can see this here. So e, del cross E rest. E rest is eta j. Eta j you can write it down. So essentially you have your E is equal to eta j. Eta dot j. Okay, so now eta physically in general is a tensor, but you can always write it down in eta x, eta y, that's it. And take the diagonal part only. You can even assume to be same, or if you want uh, an isotropic uh, resistivity, you can have different resistivity in different directions, or uh, the, and so on. And therefore, you can write down, you can just use your algebra to get these. This aspect. So, this is nothing but divergence of. So, now you know how we can write this in the divergence, and you can put this inside this. Okay. <clears throat> so, now uh, this is nothing but just a pure divergence. Remember one thing here as a del by del x, if eta is constant, there is also a divergence here. So, it's a diffusion drop. Because J has a curl of P. So you already have a, a, a derivative here and you also have a curl. Yeah, so you already are in the diffusion part here. So you have to solve this. And then it, it is very easy to solve it. Similarly, over here for the energy part, you have a divergence of this quantity, which you can write in like this. Okay. So that's what the idea is. So you write this down. Now you have the quantity divergence of flux. It's just like what you have. We're going to go basically the same, exactly the same thing. You see, the, the, think of this equation. How we solve this equation? It's, you know how to solve this equation because that is what is done. Right? It's basically uh, del by del e t plus divergence of some quantity equal to zero. You know how to do this. You have been doing this. So now in this case also it's the same thing. Del by del t plus divergence of this quantity is zero. That's how you can do it basically. And the same approach. Uh, that has been done, and then you do the operator splitting and you get the solution. So, operator splitting is integral of the order of it. It can just calculate hyperbolic. No, it, it doesn't depend on the order, but you have to follow this. Like, whichever you start first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you want to solve the problem, aren't uh, That time it was, and uh, the distributed there was only the exact term. Oh. This is because uh, I mean to say you can actually see what what magnetic field component was varying. So that magnetic field component was varying, and NZ term will come over here. Okay, so that that was the idea behind it. Right. So yeah, I mean NZ does not come in the Z component. There was no Z component. So NZ also can be put here. You can put NZ and N, uh, and uh, and Y, but NZ is common in both X and Y. So that is how it is. Okay. <laughs> so now um, looking at the parabolic term, as I was explaining to you, delta L square by eta, and delta L by Q. Right. So we know the problem here. 
So experience solution is a problem. Yeah. Now the idea is that what you do with what is known as super transistor. You know, the idea is that if you the intention is that you want to use larger time steps. You want to use larger time step, and by using the largest time step, you also want to capture this. So if you use larger time step and you not do anything, you will be in trouble. You'll be unstable. The whole system will be unstable. So the super time stepping in Rugey Gupta Legendre based on uh, the bounds of mathematical uh, kind of expression which are called the Chebyshev polynomials and super time step and Legendre polynomials. Now the idea is that you what you do is you choose a larger time step. At the same time, you also ensure stability at every time step. So that's what basically it is there. So Runge Kutta legend which you use is a multi-state scheme. It's not like you are basically doing uh, doing an explicit thing. You are choosing a slightly larger time step, but it was at the each stage you are ensuring stability, and that is kind of ensured by the by the fact that it is legendary polynomials in smooth few these stages. Okay, so so the way to do this is that you are a hyperbolic time step and the parabolic time step are related via these stages, and you can compute these number of stages. So, right, you, you, your time step is decided, whatever is your hyperbolic time step, uh, and you compute this S, and you can compute the parabolic time step. And this parabolic time step, if you use, then your solution will be stable, and this parabolic time step will be definitely greater than this. So this one is larger than delta L square by eta, but at the same time it is stable. So it is kind of faster. So there, so this is basically you can do this uh, very nice. Uh, with, I mean, we have this uh, work done with Pratik where we have uh, adopted this Runge Kutta legendary even for a simple diffusion problem. I mean, it makes it much much faster. It's very nice. It's very sweet solution, right? So that's that's how uh, resistivity is added. Now let me take take another 10, 15 minutes to explain to you how this is the source term. I do think maybe I'll find some time which now this is a term in which visual conservation. This is a pure loss term. It is a conservation of loss term. So I did if I have that happening in my scale, so that kind of let's say some shock is happening and heats the system. The idea is that I'm assuming that whatever is the heat there is kind of lost. So essentially, you have like the photons producing over there, and these photons are kind of lost to the system, escapes the system, interacting with the matter. Remember, yesterday Arusha talked about how these photons interact with them. I'm saying that these photons freely stream out. So this optical thing means photon has no hindrance in your in the matter. Uh, heat kia system go and you want to immediately cool the system. So all the photons will just escape. So it's a loss. Energy is lost uh, to the to the environment. So now how do you address this? So essentially you solve the standard equation. So I go back again to the standard equation. That's why I have this side. And look at the total energy. So it's the B. Look at the total energy. What is the total energy comprises of? What is this term? Internal energy. What is this? Static energy. So forget the magnetic energy part. So now an internal energy and a tangent. So now you are essentially updating your solution. So you are updating your E from E n to E n plus one. Now in your E n plus one, you also know rho v and rho v n plus one. You also know rho, so you can compute your mean. So if you from E n plus one and you take this quantity of n plus one, you can get rho E of n plus one. Okay. So you can just subtract it to get rho E of n plus one. Now this internal energy basically is used to compute the pressure. How? Pressure is how is minus delta. Ah, exactly. So it's my uh, rho B into gamma minus one. So for an ideal equation step. So rho e into gamma is pressure. Because pressure is a primitive variable. You want pressure in your plot. So that's how it is converted. So now the point here is that that 
if you update this equation, you solve this equation for an hyperbolic transistor, you get a row E. You have a row E. Now, if you have added this cooling, you have to additionally solve an equation to update this row E further to account for the losses due to this thing, which is in God. Okay. So, a bar hyperbolic set can be you get a row E. And this row E has to be further updated with this equation to account for this. Understand? So now your energy is not conserved because the row E will be updated. So now the row E plus row B squared is not E. E is lost. No, no, E change over here. Okay. So now the point here is that this row E has to basically be updated with this equation. And again, we use the strand splitting. Again, it's a different operator, right? It's an operator. It's a, it basically, it's just an operator. No equation we are solving. So again, we use the strand splitting over here. So in this case, uh, this is lambda. It's basically called the cooling function or the cooling curve. It depends on the density, the temperature. And x. X is basically uh, Professor X, but X is essentially the chemical uh, compositions. Sometimes the chemical compositions also come in. It governs your, uh, your uh, for example, if I have, uh, I can give an example, if I have a system of a molecular cloud, okay, and if I heat this thing, okay, what happens? What happens to the heat? What will happen to the molecules? What will happen? So, so what will happen is some energy will go in basically dissociating this. Two hydrogen molecules will be dissociated into hydrogen atoms. Usme wo heat nahi hoga. But the energy is given to dissociate. Dissociation energy. Then each atom will be vibrating. Each atom will be rotating. So that degree of freedom may be heat jack. So all that thing will be taken into account when you want to compute this cooling function. And then in the X, basically you have the rate of formation, rate of destruction. This is physical chemical kinetics. Okay. <laughs> When, when you compute all of this, rho e, and then you get this rho e star after this, you basically then update the pressure. Update the pressure. The pressure that you compute later on will basically be rho e star and rho e. Now, not just rho e. Rho e was the old one. So now your pressure is new. If it is colder, the pressure will be lower. That's colder. So the temperature is it. That's how you basically do this. Now, there are several uh, flavors of cooling uh, in, in Pluto. And I've just listed out here. For example, this is inside cooling as a transcendental cooling, which goes as rho square. So in this case, lambda is just proportional to rho square t to the power half, which is simple. Just, uh, you can compute this thing very easily, and, and you can do this. Then sometimes you have what is known as tabulated cooling. So we have a table of uh, lambda. It's a function of temperature. You can use this uh, to compute the cooling. I mean, these are all computed using cloudy, which are essentially much more sophisticated relative. So a more sophisticated one which we have is called the single ion non equilibrium cooling. So essentially, the local thermodynamic equilibrium and non local thermodynamic. Essentially, your atoms are not in thermodynamic equilibrium. So you worry about the ionization fraction. So this is a total hydrogen, and this is the ionized hydrogen. And the ionization fraction will basically change like this. This is a recombination production. This is an ionization combination, and again, this is a recombination production. And you can basically now write your rho e, which was essentially written in this form, in this manner. But J, K, and W are essentially uh, functions of temperatures and densities, but they are kind of coming from the chemical kinetics and so on. So that is what I'm saying. You can incorporate uh, the chemistry and cooling at the same time. Is that good? And molecular uh, hydrogen cooling is always a multiple ion species. Now comes the most holy problem. When the, the biggest problem in pneumonics uh, comes from such kind of problems. You can see this, as you can already see, this is so complicated. Okay, and chemistry evolves at a much faster rate than, let's say, a blob moving in the sky. Because you are advecting a blob 
of gas in sky, which moves at much slower speed, and this thing goes at much faster speed. So you again, you have two time scales. The chemical time scale which is extremely fast. So density is very small, and you have an advection value. That's the next slide, actually. So I want to capture chemistry and cooling and the advection. How do I do it? Of course, I cannot do it explicitly. I'll be doing basically. So these problems are called the stiff problems in numerics. There are there is a huge literature about solving stiff problems. Stiff problems are by definition loosely defined as a problem in which you have two different time scales, which are very different from each other. Or in this case, the chemistry evolution time scales very different than the advection time scales. So how do you handle this? One way to handle this is basically use cooling. But again, implicitly, implicit cooling uh, is a little bit inaccurate and very difficult to balance. Okay. So use explicit, and in that case, you adopt subsetting. So essentially, within one step, one advection step, you do multiple chemistry steps, small, 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 multiple chemistry steps. And there are several methods to do this. And uh, Pluto uses something called as Runge put cash count method. This is an adaptive time stepping method uh, to uh, adopt it, to take the cooling product. So the idea is you do the first one step. In between, you do multiple time steps iteratively. It's not like an iterative process. So that you are cooling convert this. And then you and uh, then you do the uh, uh, next reduction step. So, so, so that is essentially what Pluto does, and this is essentially how stiff Pluto actually. So the question is that okay, all these is so complicated. Now, do do we see any difference in any problem because of adding this code? I mean, that complicated. Huh? Why do we want to do this? So, what is the important thing? So, I have basically. And even from a general problem, a substance problem of Pluto. Definition 5 MHD J. On the left hand side, it is done without cooling. No cooling. Pure MHD. You can clearly see this feature here. And on the right hand side, it is a cooling. Can you point out two drastic differences? This is pressure, sorry. This is thermal pressure. I've got a thermal pressure. But well, that is more intuitive. Can you point out two drastic differences? In the jet. I mean, it's the same jet. I didn't change anything. What are the two major differences that you see between the two jets? Hmm. Uh, there are these bulk-like formation modes. Uh, yes, these are these intermediate shock-like features. Huh? You can see them. Huh? They are not here. I have it is shorted. Very nice. Can anyone tell me why the height is shorted? Very nice. Before we go into the shocks, let's think about why the height is shorted. It's originating from the bottom. Hey, everything is safe. There is a basically a flow coming from this funnel. It's going up. There's a flow coming from this funnel. It's going up. Of course, the features are different, but most importantly, the height is different. Why is height different? So, why would the height go less? Energy could let the energy go away. What is the problem with the height? Think about it. What is happening? It's a golden medium. Short. Short. I'm going to, I mean, okay, I'm going to put time. Is it for the same step? No, there's no nothing time step. No, similar, they have to run for exactly the same time step. If it's cooling, then it's also denser. It will be harder for the heat. Good. So essentially, the idea is that if you have a shock forming, the shock is basically getting heated up. If you have a heat, there's no cooling, and there's no exchange of heat. So it will, the heat will keep on surmounting into that or adding in. But if you basically have a cooling, in that shock region, the cooling will start happening. Okay, so you can see clearly these dense features here. Okay, these are essentially called the cooling instability uh, thing, which is essentially also these shock features. Now, because if you have this region, it's a shock region, it is hotter. 
and it is being cold in this kind of simulation, it will collapse because it loses its pressure. So the material will collapse and it gets much more denser on the top of the jet. And therefore, the, the jet would have even more hindrance to actually penetrate and thereby basically shorter jet. The idea is that that's why it's shorter than this, whereas these guys basically just can penetrate uh, as much. And these features are, all, are also called as cooling instabilities because all the shocks, now the regions of these shocks, you can see there are these internal shocks here. You cannot see them very nicely here because they are just area regions, too much heat here. But in this case, you can clearly see them because the regions of the shocks have cooled down and you dense, you produce dense features. So you see such kind of features. So uh, there's a whole family of cooling instability or Everywhere in the cooling, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's like a, a, in the shocks, where you have a shock, you would have uh, basically high temperature, cooling will become efficient, and you collapse, and you essentially form high density. So that is, so this is the beauty. So point here is that if you add more physics, you get more richer information uh, from your system. So that's what I wanted to basically demonstrate, that adding physics, even though it is complex and numerical, but it uh, gives you a lot of rewards because it can help you understand certain aspects which are essentially uh, which are essentially present in astrophysical systems. And you do see some knots in these jets, observation here. Okay, so we'll stop here. I think um, is that okay? Forty. Is that okay? Or do we have more questions? Yeah. Uh, we use like sort of like a method for the chemistry part. So mm -hmm. why don't we do that for the hyperbolic and parabolic? Mm -hmm. Nested loop in a uh, sub stepping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As in, like, you know, multiple steps in a single step. Why can't we do that for hyperbolic and parabolic? That is also done, no? I mean, to say in the heart, in this uh, uh, this thing, for example, these are multiple states. So, to give you the legendary, essentially, is a multi stage approximation. So, essentially, now the parabolic time steps, which are basically done. So, there's a hyperbolic time step. Okay, so uh, hyperbolic time step, let's say, is unity. And the parabolic time set will be 0 0.2, let's say, for all the stages. Okay, so let's say it does uh, five stage. So 0 0.2. So then it will do five times that thing, but that 0 0.2 would be definitely greater than that uh, elsewhere by air. Okay. And uh, this pseudo like both of them at like 0.2, like. Both processes at point to point four. Like that, or is it like oh, uh, it does. Uh, oh, it does everything at point to point four, like that. It will do. So okay. So uh, okay. So uh, the idea is that okay. Uh, are you saying about the time splitting? Yeah, yeah. The time splitting will be always done in the hyperbolic time. Problem oh, no. one. But when you want to solve it, okay. So let's say you want. So let's say hyperbolic time step is one. So uh, the hyperbolic will be done in by two, that is zero point five. Parabolic will be also done at one. But when you do that at one, it will conclude this and then do that substepping in that one. And then again do the hyperbolic at zero point five. So yes. So uh, what is the uh, so my half, if I don't have an adaptive mesh, then my uh, uh CFR time would be set at eight. Right. Because uh, delta x square is fixed. There is no, uh, there is no, there's always a static mesh. Oh, so you have a static right. mesh. There's right. the velocity. No? There's the velocity term. In the, so if I have a CFM, will it completely in the elasticity? In the elasticity? Yes. Huh? That's delta x square by heat. And then I don't need to adaptively change my time step also. Delta x is fixed in time. It was computing different techniques. Yes, because uh, because the point here is that uh, 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 the idea is that it all depends on the flow. So there is also flow uh, over there. Right? So it's by delta L square by eta. Right? So that is how it is there. Are, are you saying that a time stepping are changing? Time stepping will change uh, because uh, there's a minimum time stepping and you have. Uh, I think there is a uh, time square. Uh, starts with initial guess time, right? Well, it starts with initial guess time. And then it will get steady, yes. That is there. 
It is there, but uh, I think there's another term in the uh, this thing, a parabolic uh, arc, which is present. So that's what I'm saying. It's a very simple term, I think. But essentially, it has multiple. So as I can see, if in multiple dimensions, if you have different delta x, delta y, delta z, delta is also different. <clears throat> okay, so that is also there. But uh, yes, CP will be there. So there is a parabolic uh, C CFL power also. So that also you can change it. All right. Any any further questions? Any more questions? Yes. So in those terms, you only like whichever ones you could not put in the Tatarian space. Mm -hmm. Were there any terms in the source term which then have derivatives on them but couldn't be put in the Tatarian space? Um, I would uh, if there is a derivative, then I would basically do this. But there are cases. Yes, you can have, uh, for example, you can have a radiation force. You can have a radiation force. Um, for example, uh, there are something called as line driven forces. In massive stars, you basically have winds which are driven by lines. Okay. And in this line driven forces, there's an approximation called as Somolov approximation, in which case you have a derivative of the velocity along the line of sight. So that force depends on the derivative of the velocity. If that's, you cannot put it in there. So there are cases. Yes. So this is a well well established scheme. You can actually prove it. I have not proven yet. You can basically there are some algorithms to prove this. It's a well established scheme. It's a second order accurate uh, time scheme. So essentially, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but that's why I want to say, you see, when you update the solution, uh, you also want a second of the outcome space, which is governed by your remark. So, for example, the other condition you are saying, we can solve it basically just by reverse. And, and then here you will also get a second order accurate in, in, in time. Because then you want to cover this, no? You will have to ensure that you still maintain second order at the same time. When you're separating it out. And this will do it. Okay. I mean, you can go through it and you can see how it is basically done in second order. Uh, in the radiative cooling, you said that the photons are just escaping. It's not interact. So if it interacts, then that can lead to other problems called as scattering. How does that take? Yeah, so that is basically, if you want to do that into account, then you have to do the full radiative transfer. So now you basically have to take into account the intensity, how it is basically varying at each point. So you have to solve the radiative transfer equation that Anusha mm -hmm. explained to you in the last class. Because then you are uh, taking into account the interaction of the photon with the matter. So that's a completely different ballgame. Here we don't do it. So is it implemented? It is implemented, but it's not public. The radiative transfer what Anusha showed in Moran board is implemented in a different way, but is it public? Okay. Right. If there's no further questions, can you break?